hid thorn prince of peace hail the son of righteousness life and life to all he brings is with meaning in his wings while he lays his glory
Good morning, church. Take your Bibles and uh, turn with me and join me over in the Old Testament book of Isaiah. The Old Testament book of Isaiah. We're going to be in chapter 9 this morning. Isaiah 9. going to be talking this morning about the Christ of Christmas. The Christ of Christmas. Now, I know when you mention Christmas... Um, I, I'm aware in, in the day in which we live, Christ is not always the first thing thought of. Um, whenever it comes to Christmas, we often think of our traditions. We mentioned some of that last week, uh, which is not all bad. Um, I think that traditions are, are fine. I think they're, they're good. I don't think they should drive the day. I don't think they should be the centerpiece of our uh, Christmas gatherings. And so they're, therefore, I don't think they're inherently bad. I think where they become bad is whenever they uh, are now what replaces the Christ of Christmas, the reason why uh, we celebrate. And so uh, this morning, I want to zero in and focus on that very issue, uh, who the Christ of Christmas is. And um, in, in Isaiah chapter 9... I'm going to read two verses, verses 6 and 7. These will be familiar uh, to you. You will hear these in song. You'll see these in plaques and tweets and and posts and everything else. And so most of you may even have these two verses memorized. But Isaiah 9, 6 says these words, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and his name will be called... Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. 
Father, we ask now in the name of Jesus that you would speak to us. I pray every Christian in the room or watching online would be encouraged and challenged in their faith walk. I pray that everyone that is watching in here or online uh, or even days down the road that would hear this message that do not have a relationship with you, I pray that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ be ever so clear uh, to that individual that, Lord, that they just couldn't help it but to, Lord, repent of their sins and put their trust and faith in you. We're believing you for that today, Lord. And I pray, God, that you would anoint me with a Holy Ghost power from on high that I couldn't concoct and work up myself but only be explained by the power of Almighty God. We bless you and we look to you for our help. In Jesus' holy name, amen and amen. The Christ of Christmas. I want to ask the question, not for you to answer me, but for you to answer yourself. What, what immediately comes to mind when you think of Christmas? Are you one that loves the tradition? Or are you one that loathes the tradition? It, Christmas is a pretty polarizing thing anymore because you have some that, and of course, the, the, our department stores will help us to make sure we never forget Christmas because somewhere about the time school begins, they start telling us Christmas is coming, right? It used to be that it was Thanksgiving. Right after that, they'd put stuff out. Well, not any longer now, thanks or Christmas and Thanksgiving and Halloween all get to celebrate Christmas at the same time. They start uh, promoting it earlier and earlier. And so what I hear from people is earlier and earlier and earlier how much they often dread Christmas. As a matter of fact, you can test this out. Just go ahead and mark it down now. About next July, go ahead and go on your Facebook and post something about how many days till Christmas and see the responses you get. Immediately, they'll jump on you like, ah! Yeah, and it just, it just it, it polarizes us. It, it brings out a little bit of everything from us. For me, I love Christmas. I love pretty much everything that goes along with it. Um, and you guys have picked up on uh, the secret, it was a secret for a long time, but I like Christmas tree cakes. I never thought there'd be a day that I'd say what I'm about to say. Quit buying me Christmas tree cakes. Okay. I'm telling you, I'm swole up like a big old toad and I'm, my clothes ain't going to fit if you don't quit buying me Christmas tree cakes. I love you and I know you love me. That's why you're buying them, but Quit. Maybe a couple more boxes. And then after that, quit. I love them. I, I just, I do. I love Christmas. I love, I love all this stuff. That, I love the music. Um, I, I love that, that atmosphere. Betts and I went on a hot date last night. Amen. Hot date with hot mama. And we were walking through the mall. And it just, it felt Christmassy. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? And I'm not talking about like when you were people cussing one another and pulling stuff out of. I'm not talking about I'm thought It just felt Christmassy walking through there, and I'm like, it's just, it's awesome. It's a cool, uh, nostalgic kind of thing. And but yet, Christmas changes, right? It changes from year to year, and and our our traditions change. And here's primarily why: people die. That changes Christmas. Uh, Pastor Brooks and I were talking about this other day. How busy Christmas uh, is for us, and I said ours has gotten. Less and less and less busy, and the reason why is because our grandparents are dying. Um, and it used to be that Betts and I would pull up to Christmases when we first got married, and we wouldn't shut the car off because we knew we weren't staying. You'd just run in there and run out, and then when we get in the car, it's like, oh, we got so many, and we just gripe. But now we miss them and wish that we could. You get what I'm saying? But there were some that just stood out, and and there were certain things that you ate at certain places. You were always going to have. Uh, sloppy joes at at my grandma's because that's what Christians ate for Christmas was sloppy joes and you had tater candy and you go to her grandma's and you're going to have punch and that's just you don't have Christmas without punch and and homemade noodles bless and I preach myself hungry every week yet in the midst of all of it it's quite possible we do all that without the Christ of Christmas being the centerpiece of all that. So I'll just take a few moments today to, to just, if I could just brag a little bit on who the Christ of Christmas is, how he's, how he's so changed my, 
my, my life um, for all of eternity. The setting of what was going on in Isaiah's day probably is best summed up by a song that brought, was brought out in 1964. I wasn't there. Some of you were. By Simon and, is it Garfunkel? Garfunkel, what a name. Hello, darkness, my old friend. That was the era of what's happening here in Isaiah's day. They lived in darkness. They lived in such a, a place to where light would have shocked them, that, that darkness was heavy upon the earth, and, and, and God's people often found themselves in darkness. And a matter of fact, what's interesting about the text we're looking at is more darkness was coming for God's people. A group of people that were not godly called the Assyrians were, were coming to invade. And, and by the way, you know why the darkness was there? Because we can immediately jump like we do today. It's like, the, the devil. The, no, it was God's people that continued to want their way rather than God's way, which brought about darkness in the land. Can I tell you, in my estimation, that same song might really describe the United States of America, hello, darkness, my old friend. We love darkness. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about, Jesus spoke about that men love the darkness. And yet in the midst of this darkness, this prophet named Isaiah, who had had an encounter with the with, with God just a couple chapters earlier in that great chapter, Isaiah 6. And Isaiah now begins to tell us and describe to us that light is coming. Another word for that is Messiah is coming. There's coming a day that the darkness will be dispelled. There's coming a day that one who is not just bringing light, but one who is the epitome of light is coming and he will rescue us. I'm, I'm just thankful today I've met the rescuer. I'm thankful today my life's been touched. My life's been changed by the rescuer. And he's none other than Christ, the Christ of Christmas. He spoke of him over in chapter 7 in verse 14 with these words. He said, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A sign. What, what, what is a sign? A sign of, is something that's telling of something that's coming up, Right? And so, for instance, if you're driving down the highway, if you see a, a sign that has a, a curve on it, that's not placed in the curve, right? If it is, you're in trouble, okay? If you drive like I do, because I'm, I'm, the speed limit came, but I'm getting there quick. So you want that ahead of what's coming. That's what the sign is for. He's saying, behold, a sign. I give you a sign. Um, he said, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. This is a picture of his place. We're talking about the Christ of Christmas. This is his place. Well, where is his place? His place is with us. That God loved us so much that he was not content to be a God just setting up, watching out over heaven, watching this displayed among uh, or here on the earth. But yet he was sending his son, Emmanuel, God with us. I think that's a great name to give as the first name for Christ to show up. Because it's a demonstration of the character of God. He wants to be among his people. I think it's a... It's a powerful thought to think that he is a God that is with us, not just at the birth and in that manger, that through his spirit, that he is the God that is with us on our hard days now. He's a God that is with us on our days where we have buried a loved one or our days where we've got a bad diagnosis from the doctor or our days to where uh, things didn't go well at the family uh, gathering. Maybe that's a prophecy. I don't know. Uh, but you guys know what it is, right? You just got done with Thanksgiving and you're having to turn around and do it again. There's people you had not seen all year long and it's coming up. And can I just remind you, Christian, he is still Emmanuel. He's not just here to save us, but he is here to sustain us. He is here to be the one that gives us hope and to give us direction. I mentioned something on 
Facebook this morning about just excited about the day and another preacher came on and said, give them hope. And I'm like, I have nothing else to give you today but hope and hope that is found in Jesus. His name is Emmanuel. That's his place. I want to talk to you about his personality. And this is one we could certainly spend a, a, an entire series on, but he, he said unto us, a child is born, a son is given. This speaks both of the humanity and the deity of Christ. A child is born, his, his humanity, he came and took on flesh. He was a real man. There's so many that, that speak out against the humanity of Christ. They, uh, and if they do that, or if they don't do that, rather, then they want to go pick on the deity. They, it just boggles the mind to think he could be man and God. Yes, he, he, either one, you strip either one of those away, it makes him a, a liar or a lunatic. Either take either one away. If he's not God, then he's just another good dude doing something good. If you take the humanity away from it, then he's a liar now. He couldn't be trusted, but yet Jesus came as fully man and yet at the same time holding his deity as fully God. A child is born, he's man. A son is given. Well, who is the son? The only begotten son of the living God. There. It's Christmas, y'all could amen once in a while. Thank you. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And here it is. His name shall be called, and this is his personality we see, wonderful. Now, there's some discrepancy over what takes place here over a little mark of punctuation. Uh, is there supposed to be a comma after wonderful? Well, I don't know. There's some scholars that think that, his, that it, there should be a comma that says he is wonderful, Paul's. Then he is counselor, Paul's. And then there's many scholars that think, no, that the comma's not supposed to be there. It should be he is wonderful counselor. What's your thoughts, preacher? Can I give you a very um, non-scholarly answer? I don't give a rip. I don't care. If he is wonderful, that's great. If he's wonderful counselor, I knew that too, okay? So let's look at him, look at both words. He is wonderful. What does that mean to us? This is his name. He's given as a descriptor of the, the personality of this Messiah, this Christ of Christmas that is coming and said he is wonderful. He is literally, listen to me, he is literally full of wonder. He is, this, this is who he is, meaning it's just this, this picture of his personality. It's not just a characteristic. This is who, he is a wonderful God. He is a God full of wonders. He is a God that is greater than anything we have ever possibly dreamed up. Jesus spoke of it and said that it's, that it's a picture of that, that this, this frailty of man, that it's never entered into the heart of man. We can't conceive in our finite brains, the majesty and the wonder of Almighty God. And by the way, I can think up some pretty wild stuff. Now, I know I'm, I've, I'm maybe a seller too short of most of you, but I can think up some pretty wild stuff, and yet the Bible describes that you and I can't conceive. It's never entered into the heart, the mind of man. This image of God. His name shall be wonderful. That's his personality. Let me talk to you about his, his profession. He's counselor. He is wonderful. He is counselor. Okay, well, where are you going with that? It's this picture of a shepherd. The picture of a shepherd as counselor that we often talk about God as though he is this, this God that came to save us, snatch us up from hell, and then give us a place in heaven. Oh, by the way, he's up lounging next to the Father up in heaven, and he's not really all that interested in our life. Again, it's just not a biblical picture of who God is. This Messiah came to be and dwell among men. He came to be with us. What is that the picture of? The picture of him dwelling among us so that he would be in or not interested, but that he would be invested in our lives. He cares what's going on in your life. Some of you have this wrong image of him that he just, I don't want to bother him. I don't want to be a drag to him. Can I just tell you, he cares. Whatever it is that's going on, he cares. He's counselor. And yet we live in a day into which we, we feel as though all of our situations are are 
I was going to say pointless. That's not the word. Our situations are hopeless, like there's no answer to be found. And then people will get desperate enough, let's go see the preacher. Well, preacher, what do we do? We need a counselor. Who do you talk to? Well, um, Jesus. He, he, he still really gives good counsel. And by the way, there's this, this picture here of him being the, the one that, that displays for us his plans for our life. We've talked about this over and over over the years that, that, that many have bought into the myth that life is about the pursuit of the will of God. That's a wrong picture of a, of, of a follower of Jesus. We are not in pursuit of the will of God. We are in pursuit of God, period. And when we do that, what happens is we always will find his will. His will is not hidden from us. If we'll get serious about seeking him, he'll get serious about revealing his will. That's why he came. He came to be involved in our lives, not just rescue our life. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. And my soul, is he ever good at it? The situations, I can think back in my own life where it's just in a, a predicament of, what do I do now? Anybody been in one of those, even recently? What do I do now? Like, like, like 2020 has been an, uh, what do we do now? And I just tell you, and, and I'm always cautious to say what I'm about to because I know how words get twisted to the extreme. I believe in good Christian counseling. I think as a matter of fact, in a lot of respects, it's very underused. I didn't tell you I believe in all counseling, but I do believe in good Christian counseling. I'm not a counselor. Just to be clear, and those of you that have came to me for counselor, like, he ain't no counselor. I ain't. Now, I'm a fixer, okay? You come in and bring me your problems, and I say, yeah, that was stupid, and that was, here's how you do this, and we'll fix it, okay? But counselor's a whole different level of stuff, okay? So I'm not throwing shade at them. I'm not saying that's bad. Here's what I am telling you. You'll never find greater counsel than you'll find from Almighty God. And he, he just, some of us kind of think like, well, this is a little bit more than I'm going to have to get a professional. Really? Better than him? Higher than him? You say, well, yeah, but he's not talking. Really? Every single day I open up this word, guess what? He speaks. And I know we're just like, oh, Chris, oh, I know he speaks. Though he's, no, he actually does. He actually gives guidance. He actually gives direction. He actually gives hope. He actually gives peace through his word. Some of us need to get back to force feeding, open that thing up, cram your nose in it, and get a dose. Wonderful counselor. He has the ability to lay out his plan. But I like how the progression of this goes. He follows it up here with his power, mighty God. The picture is, is that he's not just a God that can reveal his plan, but he is also the God who is mighty enough, who is powerful enough to execute his plan. It's one thing to say, go do that. It's another to have the goods to back it up. Tr truth, he's got the goods. Y'all okay? He's got the goods. A few weeks ago, um, we were behind in budget, like good chunk. I mean, several thousands of dollars. I still felt good about where we were, uh, given as how Rona snatched about thirteen weeks of church from us. Um, but we're we're you know twenty something thousand behind in budget, and I'm and so we're canceling events. We're canceling our two largest events: our feed Tahlequah, our our trunk or treat gives us tons of, of, of exposure to people. And I don't mean exposure as advertising. I mean exposure as gospel saturation in our city. And uh, here we are, all these thousands of dollars behind and um, canceling outreach events. I mean, it, just, it was gloomy. It, was, it just didn't look good. It was, it was depressing, to be quite honest. And, and I, I, I really challenged our staff. I said, I want you to pray with me. I, I just, I feel like that 
The easiest thing in the world would be for us to just cancel this stuff and just kind of float out the year. I don't, I don't think we should. I, th- I think we need to do something that, that, that steps up and, and helps us to engage. It's going to challenge us. And uh, boy, they did. They prayed, I prayed, and we came back together. And out of that came this ham giveaway. And yet we started putting a, uh, a pig's expensive. I don't know if you know that. Dead pig's not cheap. And we started looking at what we wanted to do. And, and, and Pastor Sam said, that's going to probably cost $6,000. $6,000. And I'm like, we, we ought to be able to give a ham to every uh, boy, girl in, in, in all of Muskogee County for Cherokee County. I don't know what county I'm in. For $6,000. No, that's what it'll take for us to do, you know, three, 400 hams. And I just, boy, just, I sensed in my spirit as much as I was going, oh, that's a lot. That God was saying, this is what I want you to do. And it did, did it make sense? No. It didn't make sense to come and say, hey, I know we're thousand dollars behind of the year. Uh, let, can, can, can we raise another six? What do you mean raise another six? We're 20 something behind. And as I said earlier, through your generosity, your grace, or God's grace, not only did we hit our goal, I think, I think we're like over a thousand ahead of our annual giving thus far. You say, why you say that? I say that because he gave the plan. He's counselor. He's wonderful counselor, but he's mighty God in how he is the one that has the ability to execute the plan. Yes, he's going to at times ask you to do things, to trust him for things that make no sense. If you want to just simply go by, by human logic or by the world's logic, you'll never, listen to me, never experience the best of God. You won't do it. But if you want to experience God's richest, God's blessed, or his best, you've got to trust him. You've got to trust him to not just be the one that leads you to it, but the one that leads you through it. There's going to be times it's going to be dry. There's going to be times it's going to be hard. There's going to be times that you're going to be saying, God, are you sure that was you? Any of you ever done that? Like you stepped out and it's like he hadn't come through yet and you're like, hey, are we still in this? You still, you watching? Wonderful counselor, mighty God. And he's not just mighty in being able to come up with some cash, okay, which by the way, he's got plenty, okay? He's also mighty in how he supplies. Matthew uh, I think maybe more than any other of the gospel accounts give us this picture uh, of, of the, the work of Jesus and how he uh, displayed his power. Matthew 14, you remember how he took the 5,000 with just a few fishes, and I like how they say fishes. See, you, you educated people would say fish. It's fishes, plural fishes. A few fishes and loaves of bread and fed 5,000 people. He's mighty in his supply. Hey. Amen. He's mighty. Also, same chapter, uh, chapter 14, Matthew. He's mighty in storms. You remember Jesus sends his disciples out on the sea, and they're out there in the midst of this. By, by following the will of God. They didn't wind up out in a boat on the sea because they just wanted to get away from ministry for a day. Jesus told them to do it. Storm comes up, and guess what happens? Here comes Jesus taking a midnight stroke on top of the water. And Jesus gets in the boat and calms the storm and kind of gets after them. What are y'all fussing about? He's mighty. This is the picture of the Christ of Christmas. He's mighty in his supply. He's mighty in the storms. He's mighty in his strength. In Matthew 8, he has the the, the demoniac. He he delivers him from these demons. He's mighty in in Matthew 10 of his sacrifice. is the picture of the cross. This is why he came. Matthew 28, he's mighty in his superiority. Over what? Death, hell, and the grave. He is the resurrected king. Just as he said that he would do. By the way, it's not the gospel if we don't get to the resurrection, right? Because if Jesus ended there on the cross and we just put him in the tomb, all we'd be, you know what? How different would church be? You think about that for a second. How different would church be had there not been an empty tomb? We'd all just be sitting in here just staring at the preacher rather than shouting, hooping, and hollering. 
about the fact that he got up out the grave like he said he was going to get up out the grave. If you go on, it speaks of the, the permanence of the Christ of Christmas. It says that he is everlasting father. Everlasting Father. His permanence is, is that he didn't come to just be man for a time. He, he came and he will always be man. Fully God, fully man. But it's more than that. That It's not just that oh, he's going to keep his humanity forever, but it's this picture of the nurturing Father. In other words, he'll never not be Father to us. He'll never stop his nurture and his care for us. Just like you fathers, just because your children get older doesn't mean you're just like, I am just tired of being your dad. Could I just, by the way, some have done that. You know what, those are called deadbeat dads. But godly dads keep on loving. Godly dads keep on nurturing. Godly dads keep on caring and pointing their children to Christ. He says he is eternal, everlasting father. Here's, here's what ministered to me this week as I'm, I'm studying this. You know that there will never be a day in my life that I'll bring something to God that he doesn't care about. Isn't that interesting? I wish I were that way with my kids. I do. I could lie to you and tell you, but some of them are in the room and they'd, they'd probably call me out on this. Everything they bring, I'm like, oh, baby, tell me more. Because there are just times that they'll say something, I'm like, are you kidding me? Seriously? That's why you have a mother. Okay? <laughs> Jesus. <It's>, y'all, <laughs> it makes you nervous when I'm honest, doesn't it? Jesus is never going to look at you and say, that's why you have a mother. <laughs> I don't know why. It just, it just it got a hold of my spirit this week as I read that name. I've preached on this before. Everlasting Father. I'll, there'll never be a time his nurturing care for me wanes or wants or struggles. He will always, always care about that which I bring to him. I don't know who needs that today because... I, I don't know what's going on in your life, but here's what I know. With as many of us as are in the room or watching online, I, I'm certain of this. There's some of you probably struggling with what you're talking to God about, as though that he's, he's uninterested. Let me tell you what he's interested in. He's interested in you. And if what's going on in your life affects you, he's interested in what's going on in your life. You get what I'm saying? I hear people from time to time will pray about things that they like, oh, God, don't care. Like you'll pray a, about a ball game, okay? Uh, and that's how we, we do is like, God, you know, help us to obliterate that other team. You know, those, those pagan, you know, uh, Sooners or, oh, you awake now, huh? Or those wretched cowboys, Pfft. And I hear people say, God don't care about that. Let me, let me tell you what God cares about. He cares about you. He's everlasting father. I care about what affects my children. Even I, pitiful old me, I care about what affects my children. If a, if a boy breaks the heart of one of my little girls, I'm wanting to get hold of that boy, amen? With my hands, okay? And I ain't wanting to bless him. Y'all hear me? care about what affects my children. He's everlasting. Let me give you this last one and we'll be done. The last one is his provision. It says that he is prince of peace. There never may be a time in all of our calendar year that there is a lack of peace like there is a lack of peace around Christmas, which is weird, isn't it? Think about that. This is the time I described it at the beginning. This is the time of nostalgia. This is the time where you know, the, the chestnuts are roasting on the open. I don't even know what a chestnut is, but they're roasting somewhere on an open farm. I've had walnuts. I've had pecans. You Yankees eat pecans. I, I eat pecans. I never had a chestnut, but they're roasting somewhere. 
It's that magical time of year where people get to have, I love eggnog. Y'all like eggnog? Without the whiskey. You still love eggnog? Y'all better quit. Anyway, I like that. Bets, I came home other evening and she had this, this little old plastic ball hung up there in our, our little doorway. And she just stood under it going. I said, what are you doing? She goes. And so we had to have a moment of fellowship that was intense because I had to explain to her, that's not mistletoe. She's wanting a kiss. I give her a kiss anyway, just because I'm generous. I just love all that. And you would think with all that going on, and we're going to get presents too. You're probably going to get some socks. You're going to have candy. Christmas tree cakes are out. There ought to be peace everywhere, and there's not. People are hurting. And partly I'm telling you this today, not just because I know you're going through some stuff. Later on this afternoon, we're going to rub shoulders with a lot of people that have no peace whatsoever. Matter of fact, the brightest part of their day today will happen whenever we hand them a chunk of dead pig flesh. Isaiah, somewhat 4,000 years ago, told us that this son that was born, or this, this child that is born, this son that is given, would also be the prince of peace. He is the supplier of peace. How do you get it in the midst of all that's going on? How do you get it in the midst of, a, of, a, of an election? Was it rigged? Was it not? Did your guy get in or did he not? How do you get it in the midst of of racial tension like we've had? Have you ever seen anything like this? We got a, a global pandemic that's going on that was gone and then it came back and then it's gone and come back. And I heard yesterday on the news, I hope it don't get you worked up. I heard yesterday in, in, in uh, Great Britain, there's a new strand of it that's even more contagious than this strand. And I'm like, that's going to freak some people out. I got to tell them. I just did. I don't know why we would worry about that. Hell's coming for people. You'd be praying for a virus. Is that so bad as it gets? Hell's coming. And yet Jesus comes as the prince of peace. In other words, he's the keeper of peace. In other words, there's no other place to get peace. Peace I give unto you, not as the world gives. It's peace that only is found in him. Can I give you a freebie? I didn't plan this, but I want to give you a freebie. I didn't plan this. His purpose, since I'm stuck on peace today. His purpose, John 3, 16. A gift to the world. If I went, because this is a time of giving and I love that part about Christmas. I know some of you don't, but I love the gifts and love giving gifts. I love receiving. And I know some of you like the, this traditional buy me lavish gifts. Cash will do this year if you don't want to shop. That's fine. But just suppose I took all that cash you brought and I went and bought you a brand new shiny car. Pickup, whatever you need it to be, Bubba, okay? It's out in the parking lot. I told you about it. Matter of fact, I put a picture of it up here on the screen. Isn't that wonderful? You, do you see it up there? You fill in the blank what it is. This is your dream car. All the teenagers are going, oh, yes, I can, amen, I need that. It's your dream car, your dream truck. There it is. Matter of fact, it's out there in, in the parking lot waiting on you. Here's the keys. Here's what you got to do. Before you leave, you got to come get the keys from me. You can't get the keys anywhere else. Okay. Won't have another staff member holding the keys. Nobody else. I got the keys. You come get the keys from me and you go out and drive it away. And I gave it specifically to you. There'd be some of you in regards to how we would approach Jesus today that would leave here so excited, so happy. You'd go tell everybody you could tell about your brand new car, but you never came and got the keys. 
You would. You'd be, you're posting about it right now. Some of you are already typing it out. I got a brand new car. It's so good. It's brand new, Spike. Free title. I got it. I can outrun the highway patrol in this. Okay? Okay? It's fast. Can I tell you, it's worthless if you don't come get the keys. This gift that is given to you, the Christ of Christmas, is worthless if you don't come the way he tells you to come. The only way that that gift is any good is through the repentance of your sin and faith in the only begotten Son of God. Without that, you're doing nothing more than just hollow, shouting, hooting, and hollering, and it'll never do you any good. Church, I want you to know him. I do. I this is part of why Christmas is such a, a fun thing for me is because I get to, I get to celebrate all that stuff, but I get, to, I get to celebrate the one that changed and really gave me life, and he wants to do it for you.